Alright, uh, I've decided... Oh, I can fill in. Otherwise people will not... Testing. Okay, we're good. Uh, I've decided to start with the various chapters of my forthcoming book, which will be titled uh, Climate Change and... Or rather, Utopian Dreaming and Climate Change. So I start with an introduction, and then the first chapter will discuss climate change mitigation, and in it I'll discuss why I think climate change mitigation has failed, and that it's uh, so far has produced nothing. You know, all of the um, various productions from the uh, Rio summit to the uh, Kyoto Protocol to the Paris Agreement have been uh, absolute failures. And they have been such because uh, their architects have been completely lost in the utopia of money, in the whole concept of property and money and commodities determining our world and producing the utopia of you know, uh, milk and honey for the wealthiest among us and then uh, required living in the architectures without any sort of participation for the bottom third of the human race. Okay, and so that's the chapter one. Chapter one you can read online. I can give you a, a web address if you want. I presented this one two years ago at Binghamton at the World Ecology Con, um, Conference. It, the Utopian Dreaming one, which I outlined in blue, uh, it discusses a history of utopian dreaming, basically from the Enlightenment to the 1970s, when people put concepts of utopian dreaming, uh, most notably progress, development, and even more recently transition, as in transition towns, um, which is a, a you know, concept of common currency these days, um, into uh, their ideas of what the future would be about. Okay, and so there was an age of utopian dreaming. It began more or less with the, you know, um, the uh, rights of, of man and the citizen, the, a declaration of the rights of man and the citizen in 1791, in, you know, which sparked the French Revolution. And it ended more or less with the election of Reagan and the beginnings of the universal neoliberal regime. Uh, the Aldous Huxley and education thing will sort of dis move the discussion into education as a way of spreading the discussion of uh, a revival of the age of utopian dreaming, which is what I want. And, and I want to uh, spread this through education. I think that the book will be organized uh, as an educative document with a teacher's guide and a curriculum, and, which I'd like to teach here, by the way. So hand me an application when I'm finished. Uh, today I'm going to discuss in detail uh, Karl Marx and Future Studies, which will uh, discuss concepts of the future and what Karl Marx has to contribute to them. Okay. What do I mean by future studies? Uh, this is the vogue term now for discussions of the futures. There used to be futurism and futurology, but futures, futurism became a sort of uh, vogue term for a species of of art and of art criticism under Mussolini's fascism in the 20s and 30s. So, uh, futurism kind of was out is out now. Future studies is the vogue term. You know how how, how we look at the future. Uh, mostly, what we really do about the future is we impose our desires upon the future. We uh, think of the future as some kind of um, way of uh, projecting our fears about what's going to happen, uh, projecting our hopes of what's go what we want to happen, and um, saying this is what's going to be the future. Okay, so I'm going to get to that right away. The standard concept of the future is that of techno-utopia, right, uh, as combined with climate change. That is to say, the um, 
popular, popular futures that you see in books about the future, the ones at least that you can buy at Barnes & Noble, um, if you don't really want to go online and research them in detail, uh, combine th these, this dual vision. Oh, look at all the neat toys we can get. You know, and, and the um, post-humanists take this to a, a, an ultimate uh, conclusion in which they decide that eventually we will be able to transfer our, our uh, consciousness into robots and live forever as robots. Uh, but it, it, generally speaking, they think of 5G technologies or what's called the Internet of Things or, you know, technological progress considered variously. And then uh, when it proceeds to what's going to happen in the outer world in this nice little Cartesian uh, idea of the future they have where they're combining mind with body, society with nature in, you know, uh, the uh, fashion in which Jason Moore criticizes. Oh, well, he's not here. Um, at any rate, uh, they say, oh, climate change, too bad, so sad, you know. And generally speaking, the overall tenor of this you know, combination of futures, neat toys plus climate change, appears as dystopian. You know, well, we'll have neat toys, but, you know, the world is going to hell in a handbasket, and so uh, maybe we'll be able to enjoy them, and maybe we won't. Maybe they'll only be available to rich people who will then thereby separate themselves from the rest of us and become part of, of you know, what Arthur Clarke called the overmind in his novel, you know, a famous novel, 1953, Childhood's End. So in, in the essay, which I'm sort of abbreviating here, I discuss Al Gore's book, The Future, Yuval Noah Harari's Homo Deus, Lawrence C. Smith's The World in 2050, and um, Thomas Friedman's Thank You for Being Late as presenting this general picture. Okay, now, there is a critique of this, and you can find it in uh, Bill McKibben's most recent book called Falter, in which he says, look, this new techno future they're predicting is all kind of narcissistic, right? It's about people who are basically obsessed with themselves and want to use technology to amplify that same obsession. And then climate change, which is, of course, one of Bill's uh, main obsessions. He's been a climate change activist for I don't remember how long. And, um, it, he's very specific about what's going to happen, and no, it doesn't look good. Um, Bill suggests, Bill McKibben, I've talked to him twice, Bill, uh, suggests two solutions. One, solar power, ramping up with solar power. Two, uh, um, a general, global, nonviolent protest against the whole thing. You know, activism, basically. And this this is a sort of stub of a utopia. My suggestion, of course, is that utopian dreaming is our main weapon against this trend futurism that you see in the techno-utopia plus climate change futures that are generally predict predicted by those who make future studies their business. And primary or, or important about one of these futures, these these possible utopian dreams by which we might combat uh, climate change and this narcissistic regime of technology that we're being expected to endorse is that of Karl Marx, okay? Uh, what's special about the Marx utopia? Well, first off, it's non-capitalist. We need a utopia to combat what Mark Fisher called capitalist realism by which nobody can imagine a, an alternative to endless capitalism extending into the future because it's become so normal, right? And then, um, secondly, Marx really does get into great detail about how, uh, what he wants to see in his critique of political economy as mentioned in uh, the Gridrissa Capital Volumes 1 and 3 especially is uh, an overcoming of the regime of value. Okay, an overcoming of the regime whereby this autonomous process of value determines the course of our lives. And the primary evidence of how this works is through the document that we all are very familiar with, and I'll bet everyone in this audience has one of them. It's the Curriculum Vita. Curriculum Vita, the Curriculum Vita is Latin for the course of one's life. Okay, and in the curriculum vita, you are expected to display for an audience of 
prospective employers how your life has been spent increasing your value as an employee, okay? You know, what sort of education you've had, you know, how you've managed to project and stuff to, you know, help your prospective employer recoup the cost of the labor, uh, or the wages they're going to pay you, right? So, um, and at any rate, Marx suggests an alternative to the society as dictated by value and by the curriculum via by this, and you can find it in those particular chapters. Okay, so this is the basic opposition. Trend futurism with the Internet of Things and et cetera, et cetera, versus the utopian dream, the Marx utopian dream. And it's the one that he mentions now and then in his critique of political economy. Um, in adopting Marx in this way, I'm um, more or less going against the version of utopia that you see in uh, Friedrich Engels' Socialism Utopian and, Sci uh, and Scientific, in which he suggests that um, Marxism is, quote-unquote, scientific socialism. Um, after 140 years of uh, Engels' Utopianism, Socialism, and Scientific, we still aren't at scientific socialism yet. We're back at the place where we're still, we're still at, at the most, at the best, dreaming utopically of an alternative to capitalism without any science involved in it at all. So that's where we're at. And um, the, the thing that is special about the Marx utopia is that he suggests that, and here's a quote from Marx from the Grandressa, it translated, of course, Labor would be organized in such a way that the individual's share in common consumption would directly follow. Okay, this is his dream. And what this means, in short, is that we would have a society in which um, the process by which everyone decided who got what, and each individual would decide what to do, would be the same process, more or less. Right? We would have overcome the regime whereby the value of, um, the, the accumulation of value of a few, the capitalist class, would decide how everyone else was to behave as an object of value, which is to say, you guys, the working class, okay? Um, and uh, that's what we would have. Um, there's also, of course, the simpler, the simpler version of this, the union of free producers that's mentioned briefly in volume one of Capital, which I'm, I'm sure a lot of you are familiar with that. Um, this version of uh, Marxism is, as I put it in the paper, opposed to what I'm calling manifesto futurism. And this is a reference to the famous line in, in the Communist Manifesto where he suggests that uh, associ association in the factories will more or less be the, the death knell of the capitalist system. Uh, and it, of course, it didn't become true. And um, this was this line was more or less a, a moment of hubris upon the part of Marx and Engels upon the revolutions of 1848, which were going on at the time. And uh, what happened was that um, in Marx's later life and after he died in 1883, uh, there was con created by various personalities a construct called Marxism, which adopted very little of what we actually know about Marx now. Okay, there's a lot of reasons why we know a lot more about what Marx wrote now than they did. Mostly that Marx was ill a lot, and that he was a horrible perfectionist, and that um, a lot of it didn't come out, and Engels had to put it out after he died. Um, so at any rate, um, this version Right, of Marxism, uh, uh, which I call Manifesto Futurism, tends to accept as an iron law of the development of the future that which Marx and Engels more or less proposed out of some kind of momentary motive of theirs. Right, and you know, um, what was not necessarily intended at all to be part of any iron system of inevitable capitalism is uh, uh, this portion of Marx uh, should be viewed, I think, as uh, 
a dead end, right? Uh, so um, not necessarily leading to the utopian dream which we want, which would be a utopian dream of an ecotopia, an ecological civilization, the sort of thing that, that Chris Williams and Fred, Mag, Fred, Fred Magdoff more or less get to in a very sketchy outline form when they talk in their book, Creating an Ecological Society. And I think I'm going to leave it at that. Uh, thank you for your attention.